Well, good evening and welcome to session seven. We are going to be more than halfway through this uh, spring session in the Adult Gospel Project. And so far, I think it's been really good and really encouraging. So thank you for hanging with us and sticking with us. Um, in today's session, we are looking at uh, session two of unit 32. And this session is called The Church is Sent to the World. And so um, what we're going to look at today is how God sends missionaries from the church to take the gospel to Jesus to the entire world. So just a reminder as we go through this session, when they, we get to those moments of, of thought or interaction, feel free to pause this video at any time to think through your own answers or to consider what is being taught um, so you can really you know, let it drive deep down into your heart and to your mind. And so, again, today we're looking at how God sends missionaries from the church to take the gospel of Jesus to the entire world. Um, how does this help us connect to Christ, and what is the Christ connection in all of this? It's this. Jesus told his disciples that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church, reminding us that God's people are in offense, continuing the mission Jesus began. God's plan is for missionaries to take the powerful and good news of Jesus to places of deep spiritual darkness with full confidence that Jesus will build his church. Now, real quick, being from St. Louis and uh, enjoying sports like I do, um, many of you will remember the 1999 St. Louis Rams. Um, you remember this team because they hadn't been very good in the four years prior. And then in 1999, um, all the pieces came together. Our star quarterback at the time ended up getting hurt in preseason, and in comes a guy named Kurt Warner. And from the very first game all through the season, um, they revolutionized the offense in the National Football League. You remember what that team was called? They were called the greatest show on turf. No one had ever seen an offense quite like that with Marshall Falk and Torrey Holt and Isaac Bruce and our you know, our tight ends and Orlando Pace, you know, holding up the blind side. They just were phenomenal. They scored so many points. They broke so many records and they ended up winning the Super Bowl. And I've always been taught, you know, in sports that good defense always beats good offense. But I think the 99 Rams showed us that a really great offense can really beat really great defenses. And I remember in the 1999 NFC Championship game, we were playing against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and they had a really great defense. And we barely won that game. I think the score was like 11-6, um, something like that. And um, they really uh, did their best to keep us from scoring, but they ultimately couldn't. And so why I bring that up is because as Christians, we know that we are in a spiritual fight um, with the kingdom of God being both physical and invisible. We know that there are spiritual forces at work against us, and so we are engaging in this fight. And so we can't win this fight by holding up and being on defense. We've also got to take up the sword and sword of the word, the, uh, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. We've got to enter into this battle. And so I just say that because that's what reminded me when I was reading through this lesson and, and working through it that as God has called us all to be missionaries, to take the gospel to all people, that we are to engage with them and not sit back on defense, hoping that, that maybe somewhere along the lines we'd have a conversation with someone about Jesus. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump on in. So uh, let me explain on page 66 in your daily discipleship guide, we're going to look at the stories of William Carey and Andrew Fuller, two missionaries. Um, you may have heard of them, you may not have heard of them, but I certainly would suggest um, picking up one of their, their biographies or their books. They make actually books for kids about these guys, and they are phenomenal. Um, and so let's look at the stories of William Carey and Andrew Fuller. So on page 66, read along with me. Many have called William Carey, born 1761 and died in 1834, the father of modern missions. But the impact of Carey's missional endeavor never would have been known if not for his dear friend, Andrew Fuller. Through the reading and the study of God's Word, Carey and Fuller came to the conviction that every church and every believer were commissioned by Jesus Christ to share the gospel, even and especially to those who lived in the furthest reaches of the earth. Carey acted upon this conviction by embarking to India. Before leaving, Carey 
memorably told Fuller, I will go down into the mine, but remember that you must hold the rope. William Carey also says this, he's quoted as saying, If it be the duty of all men when the gospel comes to believe unto salvation, then it is the duty of those who are entrusted with the gospel to endeavor to make it known among all nations for the obedience of faith. Let me ask you this question. How can rope holders support others in their missionary efforts? How can rope holders support others in missionary efforts? So let's think along the lines of those who we raise up in the church and send out to, maybe it's the inner city, um, maybe it's to plant a church, maybe it's to go overseas into an unreached people group. But those of us who support them financially and come alongside them, maybe go visit them, give them some furlough, um, support them financially and pray for them. That's the rope holder. How can rope holders support others in their missionary efforts? We can do this through a couple of ways. We can pray for missionaries. We can support them financially. We can provide needed resources, maybe New Testament in, in their language. Um, we can help take care of missionaries' responsibilities back home. We can join them for periods of time to assist in the work of sharing the gospel. For the next two decades, Fuller rallied the churches of England to missions. His writings influenced Christians throughout Europe and America to support the missionary endeavors of William Carey and others. While the Great Commission is every Christian's obligation, some may be called to hold the ropes at home so that others can go into the pit of spiritual darkness with the light of the gospel. The Holy Spirit plays the lead role in the missional efforts of the church. This truth is abundantly clear as the assembled church at Antioch sends out the first missionary team. In this session, we will see how the church, in obedience to the Great Commission and the call of the Holy Spirit, goes on offense in a new way while the enemy plays defense. Although the focus will be upon Barnabas and Saul, the whole church was involved in their missionary enterprise through through prayer, fasting, commissioning, and support. Point one, page 67. God raises missionaries from the church. God raises up missionaries from the church. On page 67, read along with me Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and prayer, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. On page 67, let's read about in this first paragraph. And we want to highlight the diversity of the church in Antioch. And that's a model for us today. From chapter 13 onward, the epicenter of Christian influence and missions in the book of Acts moves from Jerusalem to Antioch. Church leadership and the membership at Antioch was diverse across ethnic and socioeconomic lines. Just as the church was birthed in diversity by the Holy Spirit, the gospel of Jesus Christ is for all people of every ethnicity, socioeconomic background, and educational attainment. All sinners are welcome at the cross. So if you look at these characters that are in these first three verses, we got Menaean, and he was a close friend of King Herod, the regional authority. Likely was situated near the top of the socioeconomic ladder. And then you got Lucius and likely Simon, who were both from North Africa. And Simeon's name, commonly called Niger, probably indicates that he was African American. Barnabas was a Jew of some means, able to sell some property for the support of the church. And Saul was a Roman citizen, a well-educated Jew. He also was a tent maker, a skill he would use to support his missionary endeavors. The gospel of Jesus Christ came first to the Jews, but it was also intended for the Gentiles by Old Testament prophecy. Jesus' own words in the direction of the Holy Spirit. Initially, the church had seen um, had some difficulty seeing this holy trajectory. But God helped his people along. Philip baptized an Ethiopian eunuch at the Spirit's direction in Acts chapter 8. 
Peter witnessed the Spirit coming upon Cornelius, a Gentile God-fearer, in his household when they believed. It's Acts chapter 10. At Antioch, most believers evangelized only Jews. But some spoke also to the Gentiles, many of whom believed in Jesus. Later, the work of the Holy Spirit in Antioch was confirmed by Barnabas, who was sent from the church in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit influenced the spread of the gospel, the results of the gospel, and the unity of the gospel. In the second paragraph on page 67, we're going to note that worship, fasting, and prayer should be practiced in the church as they lead to missions. Read along with me. Through persecution, the Lord brought together the church at Antioch. The hand of the Lord was with them. With their growth and the miracle of God in their diversity, it would have been easy to settle in and coast, even become complacent. But they remained true to their Lord, worshiping, fasting, and praying. In the midst of their devotion, the Holy Spirit called the church to set aside two of their leaders to continue the work of spreading the gospel. This is a vital aspect of the mission of the church spreading the gospel, and planting churches to the ends of the earth. Have you ever worshipped um, on your own? Have you ever fasted through a season or a time to find through prayer answers to um, spiritual things you were seeking? You know, there are three milestones in the New Testament, and they're worship, fasting, and prayer. Um, We can see this as we read through the New Testament. Anna, a widow who served God in the temple through fasting and prayers, was one of the first to testify of Jesus, our Redeemer. You can check that out in Luke chapter 2. The first missionaries were sent out from the church after a season of worship, prayer, and fasting. See Acts 13 for that one. And finally, the first appointment of elders in newly planted churches by Barnabas and Paul, also known as Saul, was accompanied by prayers and fasting. Acts chapter 14. This applies to us kind of like this. According to a Barna study, even though the Bible and churches encourage even even though the Bible and churches encourage fasting for religious reasons, the people most likely to engage in religious fasts are adherents of non-Christian faiths. In fact, the non-Christian people of faith are twice as likely as Christians to engage in fasting. To be clear, the New Testament writers focus far more on prayer than they do fasting. But given the challenges facing the church today, does it make sense to neglect any of the offensive tools God has provided His church for wise decision and making and spiritual discernment? Let's interact a little bit. Let me ask you this question. What role does the church have in calling in the calling of people to ministry and missions? So what role does the church have in the calling of people to ministry and missions? Obeying the Holy Spirit and affirming His call on people. The church plays a part in encouraging believers to use their spirit-given gifts for the love and edification of the church and her ministry in the community and world. Praying for the Lord to raise up leaders and missionaries. And the church also... um, supports them by those who are called by God to his work by supporting them. Go to page 67. You're probably already there. Let's go ahead to this essential doctrine and fill in the blank time. And this essential doctrine is the mission of the church. You're probably somewhat familiar with this, but if not, we're going to walk through what the Bible actually teaches us about what the mission of the church is. So follow or read along with me. The church is a sign of an instrument of the kingdom of God, a people united by faith. A people united by faith. In the gospel announcement of the crucified and risen King Jesus. The mission of the church is to go into the world. The mission of the church is to go into the world in the power of the Spirit. In the power of the Spirit. And make disciples by proclaiming this gospel, calling people to respond in ongoing repentance and faith, and demonstrating the truth and power of the gospel by living under the lordship of Christ for the glory of God and the good of the world. Page 68, point two. God guides missionaries to proclaim the gospel. 
God guides missionaries to proclaim the gospel. Let's go ahead and read um, in Acts chapter 13. Let's pick it up in verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, or he was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. The first paragraph on page 68, it helps to point out that the activity of the Spirit was acted upon with the planning and purpose. It's a misconception to think that being led by the Spirit is a matter of just showing up at a random time or place. It is true that God can and does use our happenstance and even missteps from time to time. But be assured that the planning and purpose are equally a part of God's plan. After Barnabas and Saul were sent out from the church in Antioch, they didn't just find themselves on the shores of Cyprus. First they had to get to Seleucia, a port 16 miles away. Then they had to find a ship sailing to Cyprus. They had to pay the fare, secure provisions, and engage their plan for sharing the gospel once they were on the island. Early, um, this pastor writes, early in my ministry calling, a wise pastor told me never to get into the pulpit unprepared. Quote, while God may give you words in a time of need and at a moment's notice, imagine how much better things will go when you give him hours to work in you through planning and studying in the word. I remember reading this in different pastoral books and preaching books and how important it is for those of us who preach and teach to immerse ourselves in the words and devote ourselves to studying and understanding the scripture. And the scriptures even talk about being a workman approved by God. And I think it's a mistake for us to not pursue the word, to pursue God in prayer about who he may put in our, um, in our lives that we can bless and share the gospel with. We need to be a people of intentionality. We need to live intentional lives for the sake of the gospel with Christ at the center. So let me ask you this question. What plans do you think our church have to share the gospel both locally and around the world? If you're not familiar with First Christian Church Union or other churches in the area, or churches you've been a part of, you'll know that our church here, we have missionaries in um, the Ukraine. We have missionaries in Mexico. Um, we have uh, missionaries um, in Africa. And we support them financially and through prayer. Um, they give us updates. Um, some of our people go and spend time with them throughout the year and see them. In fact, we have a Nino strip coming up to Mexico. Um, this fall. And so actually, if you're interested in, in being a part of that, we have a meeting on Sunday, May 2nd, following second service right here in the church building. And we support them by going and, and visiting them and by supporting them financially and praying for them and seeing the work that God is doing. But then also locally, what we're trying to do is we're trying to equip each and every believer in our church um, to share the gospel. So that happens through our Sunday morning preaching, that happens through our small groups. It happens through our Wednesday night class and Sunday morning class. It happens through our children's ministry. It happens through um, our relationships with one another, encouraging one another. Who may God be putting in your path to bless, to pray for, to eat with, to share the good news of Jesus with? Those are some of the ways that we plan on doing that, and we plan on unveiling and rolling out more things for our church to equip you to share the good news wherever you may go. On page 68, the second paragraph, um, we're going to look at how this emphasize, you know, to emphasize what we've been learning that the faithful gospel witness will encounter opposition. Um, this is the plan of the evil one to oppose us, and so we've got to be prepared for that. So read along with me. Following the lead of the Holy Spirit. Barnabas and Saul met their first recorded resistance to the truth of God's gospel message. 
They began their ministry in Jewish synagogues, but they were not exclusive in their proclamation. The Gentile authority over the island wanted to hear the message. What an open door offered to them to influence a leader and all the people he was responsible for. But then stepped in their opposition, Elimus, a man who should have known better, but who was devoted to his own deception and selfish gain. Elimus, a Jew, likely knew the Mosaic Law's prohibition against sorcery and divination. He also would have been aware of God's dire warnings against false prophets. But if he knew the teachings of the law, then he chose to spurn them. He opposed the message of the gospel and worked hard to distract and dissuade his employer from the message of eternal salvation. Let's try to illustrate this. Um, a pastor uh, wrote this about his life. He says, One of my best friends was slowly warming to the gospel. Although he was not a churchgoer, his wife attended periodically, but she was not a good witness by any measure. This added to the challenge of helping him see the difference between being religious and having a true relationship with Jesus Christ. Once, while we were camping, he started asking serious questions about Jesus. He says, just as I was sharing the gospel, his wife called. I recalled him asking, should I answer it? And I said, of course. Almost immediately, the two got into an argument about a trivial matter. That night was the one and only time my friend has opened himself to hearing the gospel. Upon reflection, I realize a fatal error in my testimony. I did not get to the gospel soon enough. I was sharing a testimony, a story about me and too little about Christ. I think we all can relate to what we would think are missed opportunities. And I think sometimes we make more things about us and less about Christ. And I think the point he was trying to make is when God opens that door to share the gospel, get to the gospel first. Get to Jesus first. Don't get to, to the church you attend. Don't get to denominationalism. Don't get to um, other stories. Get to Jesus. God's power is revealed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. This was one of the verses that transformed Martin Luther, that's transformed um, the, the, the Reformation in the 16 or the 1500s. But the enemy will seek to oppose those who are faithful to share God's good news. So be prepared for both opposition and success. And if you're not experiencing opposition when sharing your faith, perhaps you're not sharing your faith enough. Let me ask you this. What are some reasons people may oppose the spread of the gospel? What are some reasons people may oppose the spread of the gospel? Ignorance of what the gospel message means. Sometimes we don't know what it means. We don't really know what it fully means. We haven't really wrestled with it and, and really let it saturate every part of our lives. Perhaps greediness for the worldly gains that come from a non-Christian worldview could be opposition. A selfish desire to be seen as the authority and savior rather than Jesus. Unknowingly serving the purposes of the devil. The gospel interferes with people's devotion to sinful living. I love that old hymn. And it talks about um, that the cross bids me to come and die. And in the world we live in, it's not an easy thing to give up our rights um, for the rights of God and for, to, for the service of others. And so we've got to learn to live and wrestle with that tension that to follow Christ means to sacrifice. Point three on page 69. God gives missionaries power to validate the gospel. God gives missionaries power to validate the gospel. Acts chapter 13 Let's pick up verse 9. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him. And he went out, went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed 
when, they, when he saw what had occurred. For he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. On the first paragraph on page 69, we're going to look at how the church was not allowed the enemy to go unopposed. Paul declared that Elimus was full of all deceit. A similar expression is found in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 27. The evil among God's people described in Jeremiah 5, 20 through 31 is a reminder that though times change, opposition to God's word remains unchanged. Jeremiah uh, spoke of God's opponents as rebellious, wicked, appalling, and horrible. They were like hunters lying in wait with a trap to catch men. They excelled in evil matters and prophesied falsely while ruling by their own authority. Paul encountered the same realities in the person of Elimus. And just as with ancient Israel, the Lord would punish and avenge. Since the day the serpent opposed God's command related to the forbidden fruit by declaring, No, you will not die. The enemy has employed deceit, trickery, and lies to oppose God's word. In Paul's list of the works of the flesh, he includes idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy. You can see that in Galatians chapter 5. Each of these could describe the actions and motivation of Elimus. Like his father, the devil, Elimus twisted God's commands and, expect, and expectations to keep Sergius Paulus from a saving relationship with God. Paul's response to his opponent may appear harsh on the surface, but allowing wicked opposition to go unchallenged results in great harm, especially when eternity is at stake. So the one who falsely claimed to be able to see into the future would be stricken blind in the present at the word of Jesus' apostle. It would be easy to point to Elimus, Elimus's blindness and Sergius Paulus's subsequent belief and think, the people I want to reach don't see miracles like that happening today. But the sentiment fails to take into consideration that the teaching of the Lord astonished the proconsul, not simply the miracle. Paul's means of addressing his opponents was a spirit-inspired pronouncement of blindness upon Elimus. In short, a miracle. But God's messengers in the book of Acts often answered their opponents with a simple proclamation of the truth of the gospel. When the Sanhedrin, the leaders of the Jews, warned Peter and John not to preach in Jesus' name, the apostles declared their intent to continue on in faithfulness to Jesus. The Sanhedrin arrested the two apostles a second time and flogged them. But Peter and John rejoiced and continued preaching the gospel. Stephen was accused of blasphemy, and his defense was a sermon before he was stoned to death. Rather than seeking a miracle to address those who opposed our evangelism, we should focus on sharing the teaching of the Lord, the gospel, which tells of God's chief miracle, Christ crucified and raised for the salvation of sinners. In the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, Jesus communicated this truth. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. A miracle by itself may wow those who witness it, but unless that miracle is accompanied by the shared message of God's word, then it will do little to change the heart. Scripture makes it clear that signs and wonders can arise from both the hand of God, as in our text, and through the deception of the enemy, 2 Thessalonians 2.9. The power of God to save is not found in miracles, but in the gospel. What are some ways the gospel message is validated today? So think through your life. Think through your faith. Think through how you've seen God interact in this world. What are some ways that the gospel message is validated today? In some ways, similar to Bible times, chiefly through the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of sinners who hear the gospel perhaps through miracles, through the sanctification and holy lives of believers who share the gospel, through conviction in the sinner's heart, through opposition from the world. You know, I think about how the gospel message is validated today, and I think through church history. 
And I think how God has secured his church with corrupt leaders all throughout the centuries. He's protected and preserved his word through corrupt churches and through corrupt people throughout the centuries. I think of men like Billy Graham, who um, was a good speaker but wasn't considered to be the best of his time and how he would go out and preach the gospel through different revival big tent tours on TV. Millions and millions of people heard the gospel proclaimed from Billy Graham and yet many were saved. I think of how folks like R.C. Sproul can be saved by an obscure verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 19 that talks about how men will die just like beasts. And at that moment, R.C. Sproul said he accepted Christ because he knew eternity was at hand. You see, the gospel message is at work because the Spirit is at work in people's lives. And so when we share the scriptures and remember that Isaiah 55 11 says that the word of God does not return void and when we pray for others and we know that God hears our prayer prayers and answers these prayers and we see people accept Christ in faith because the spirit was at work in their lives through a simple gospel message about who God is who we are and what he's done to make us right through Jesus Christ it's a simple message and by faith we believe And for me, I see that validation through the ordinary means of the grace of God that people come to faith, even in our church today, even in the midst of this pandemic. We're seeing new families. We're seeing people who did not walk with Christ come to walk with Christ and put their faith in Him and immerse themselves in in baptismal waters. I see God working, and that validates in my own life, but also in the life of this church and our community, that the gospel still saves. Let's move on to our mission. The first gospel missionary was Jesus, who came from heaven to earth to provide our salvation. As we seek to become imitators of God, we too must take on the role of a missionary and share the good news with those around us. We also must faithfully send and support those who take the gospel to communities and countries with people who have never heard the gospel. As we respond in obedience, God will guide and send us by his Holy Spirit to those who need the gospel. Be they people whom we know or total strangers, we may experience opposition and discomfort at times, but we must hang in there. For ultimately, we will see the power of God change lives as men and women joyfully respond to the teaching of the Lord. The mission of the church is to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the entire world. Let's be about that work today. Let's be about that work this week. Let's be about that work our entire lives. Now I want to encourage you um, as we go through this closing section. How will you respond to the truth of God's word? How will you respond to what God's calling you to do? Because God sent Jesus to us, To provide our salvation, we send, support, and consider being missionaries to those who have never heard the gospel. How will the Holy Spirit calling you to respond to his word? Or how is the Holy Spirit calling you to respond to his word? And how will you obey? What are some ways your group, church, can support missions, both locally and globally? With whom is the Holy Spirit leading you to share the gospel, even though there may be opposition? Tony Evans, Priscilla Shire's dad, pastor, good man, he says this, There is no doubt that the the Lord will fulfill all his sovereign purposes. The question is this, will he accomplish his, his will through your obedience, resulting in your blessing, or in spite of your rebellion, resulting in your shame. It's your choice. Let's close in prayer, and may God bless you and keep you this week. Um, May we learn to share the good news that's taken us from death and given us life, how important that is to us. Let's pray. Father, um, you sent your Son to live the lives we should have lived, to exchange his righteousness for our unrighteousness, to take our sin and put it upon himself. Lord, not so that we could hoard it and keep it to ourselves, not so that we could 
hide away from this world, Lord, but by your Spirit coming as Christ ascended to empower us to be your instruments, to share the testimony and witness of what you've done in our lives. Lord, it may be those who live within the four walls of our homes. It may be to those who we work with. It may be to those who work at the stores that we visit to purchase things. It could be to those neighbors across the street. It could be praying for those who don't know you. Lord, it could be praying for those missionaries who you've called to send out to places that we can't go to. Lord, I pray that you would convict our hearts and equip us to believe that the Holy Spirit is enough to equip us to share the good news of Jesus. Help us to embrace this gospel. That our heart would grow in affection and love for you because of your love for us. May you bless us this week, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You all have a great week, and we will see you next time.